All right, just before I start, I'd like to let you all know that I will be doing a Q&A um, at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, just feel free to jot down a little message or just jot it down into the Q&A and I'll, I'll go through them all at the end. So don't worry, um, your questions will be answered. I think now is also um, a good time to start. So I'll start off by introducing myself very quickly. My name's Mary. Um, I'm the Operations Officer at Expat Housing Network. I've been working here for two and a half years now, and I will be presenting the Renting in the Amsterdam Metropolitan Area presentation for you today. So there we go, let's begin. Oh, something that I'd also like to say, sorry, just before we start is we are indeed recording this, uh, this webinar. So if you have any questions or anything at all, um, or you just wanna quickly go through it again, um, just let us know and we can send that through to you. Let me just make sure that it is indeed recording just because technology can sometimes, uh, <laughs> technology can sometimes fail me. So I just want to make sure I've got this all as it should be. Yeah, all right, perfect. And we are good to go. So first we'll start off with some topics that we'll be covering tonight. So in this presentation, we will be talking about what kind of apartments might suit your needs as there are a few different types of apartments available for rental in Amsterdam. So I'll be going through those. Um, whereabouts you might wanna live in the city or its surrounding cities, the general costs of what to expect when living in Amsterdam and the metropolitan areas. Uh, we'll be discussing resources of how to search the market, um, the types of contracts that you'll see um, whilst looking for rental apartments and a lot of other little tips and tricks that we'd just like to, to share with you. So first, let's talk about the housing market. These here are some words that you will have probably heard of when, uh, when describing the Amsterdam rental market. It's expensive, the flats are small, it's tough, it's very fast, um, it's very, there are sharing restrictions. Now these are all true, uh, but there is a way to navigate it. But the, I do wanna stress that the market does move very quickly. So even though there is a way to navigate it, you do have to kind of be on the ball. So in this slide, this kind of explains why the market has to move so quickly. So you'll see in the top left corner, the 57% of the regulated sector. So the uh, regulated sector is essentially social housing. So it's for um, people who are uh, from the Netherlands originally and people who, have a, who are under a threshold of a certain income. So they are, there is a base, rate, a base rate of 720 euros for rent per month. And if you are not um, a Dutch citizen, then there is a 10 to 14 years waiting list to actually get onto one of these properties. So these properties would not be available for expats to rent, which brings us to the remaining 43%, which is the free sector, which is what we'd be looking at now. Even though it does seem like there's 43% of the properties available for expats to rent, in fact, it's only 10% of that, as 90% are privately owned and inhabited by the owner. So the, the other 10% of that, that is, the, that is what is available to rent for expats, which shows you how quickly you'll have to move because there is quite a small pool. And then this is just another way of kind of seeing, uh, seeing the numbers. So there is a total of 443,000 homes in Amsterdam. They are planning on building more, but I believe that, um, that perhaps this process was slowed down. But at the moment we are on 443,000 homes in Amsterdam, 2, uh, 239,000 of which are the regulated rental homes, 194,000 are the private sector ho homes. And then that small orange slice there, that 19,000 is what would be available to rent for us expats. Now we're going to talk about the types of apartments that you can see um, in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands. So there are three main types. Um, let's start off with the shell apartment, because when I first moved here, I found it was, I, I'd never heard of shell apartment before, so perhaps it'll be interesting to you guys as well. So the shell apartment, as is the name, is literally a shell. So it comes... With no, it comes with a cement floor, as you can see in the picture on the top left, but it doesn't actually have the wood flooring uh, or the parquet, or you would need to purchase your own floor, which does sound like a big deal. To me, it did sound quite scary at the beginning. I still have yet to, uh, to purchase my own floor, but it is very common here uh, to purchase your own floor. And then at the end of your tenancy, you can either take it with you or sell it on to your, or sell it on to the next tenant who will then look after it. And then it will then be, then be their responsibility. But in the shell also you'll notice that there's no fixtures, like it's literally a shell of a house. 
But the good part of getting a shell is they are significantly cheaper to rent. And also you will have pretty much no, no chance of losing any of your deposit because there would be nothing for you to damage. Unless for example, you broke a window, but normally they'd be double glazing. So that'd be quite difficult. Now moving on to the unfurnished apartment, which you can see in the bottom left corner um, is again, as the name says, it's just an unfurnished apartment. So it has all of the fixtures. It's got the kitchen fitted in. If the walls are all painted, you've got your floor. Um, you do have your, uh, your light fittings, but a lot of the time um, the light fittings, well, yeah, I'd say a lot of the time the light fittings, um, you'll actually have to attach yourself, but they will be available for you to attach. So for example, in my apartment, we moved in um, and we had to put in all the lights ourselves, but that's very standard. Um, and then, yeah, with an unfurnished apartment, you would have to then obviously buy your, your main big furniture, your main big furnishings, so beds, sofas, but it will have everything ready there for you to just quickly move into and make your own home. And then moving on to the third type of apartments, which is at the top right, is the fully furnished apartment, which in the Netherlands is fully furnished, as in it comes with crockery, it comes with your bed sheets. It's literally an apartment where you can just bring in your suitcase of clothes and feel like you're ready to live and you hit the ground running. So those are the three main types. You can also get a kind of semi-furnished, um, but then that, that would still be called and unfurnished a lot of the time where it just has the soft furnishing. So it'll have your curtains um, and it'll might, it might have a table, for example, but the three main that you will see are shell, unfurnished or fully furnished. Now we'll talk a bit about the areas in Amsterdam and the surrounding cities as well. So here we go. This is a quick map of Amsterdam. Something that I like to stress here is even though the map does look like everything is far away. So for example, if you go to, uh, let's say De Barsius, which is in the top left, and then going down to Oud Oost, it looks like it would be far away. But something that I do like to stress is everything from one end of the city to the other is within a half hour cycle. So it's really not that far away. Amsterdam it does feel like a small city, which I think is a lovely benefit because it does feel, it's got that kind of like, homely charm and it's one of the reasons why I love it you get to travel around and cycle around and it's just a lovely way of life cycle culture is fantastic you guys will love it <laughs> but um yeah that's something that I do like to stress uh, that everything is closer than it actually seems and then keeping on with this theme we'll go on to the uh, uh to the metropolitan cities surrounding Amsterdam so again they do look very far away but you'll see that we've put the timings down on how long it actually takes to get from these surrounding cities to the center, to the center, uh, to central station. So, for example, uh, for example, Harlem. It's also known as the Mini Amsterdam. It's uh, it's got all the charm. It's got the beautiful buildings and the canals. It just doesn't have as many tourists. But I have to say, it is becoming increasingly popular because it is now known as the uh, the Mini Amsterdam. So the property prices aren't as cheap as they used to be, but they are still cheaper than in the center of Amsterdam. But Harlem is only a 15 minute train ride to the center of Amsterdam. Hofdorp only 25 minutes. Amstelveen, you'll see that there are two timings here. It's because there's currently a metro line being uh, directly built between. So at the moment, it is 40 minutes commute by taking the bus, um, but there is going to be a 20 minute uh, metro which will take you directly to the center. So that's en route. Now Hilversum, which seems the farthest away, is also only 20 minutes. And then Almira, um, more up and coming, um, is between 30 and 40 minutes by train. So the benefit of moving uh, to, a pro uh, to a property that is within the um, Amsterdam metropolitan areas is because they are cheaper than in Amsterdam, but, they, uh, but access to Amsterdam is still just as easy. So that is something to think about when you're thinking about when you might want, want to move to the Netherlands. And speaking of costs, we will now talk about other costs to, uh, that you will have to keep in mind when, uh, when renting in the Netherlands. So first off, we'll talk about the diff uh, price differences between um, apartment types and apartment sizes in Amsterdam and its surrounding cities. So you'll see here, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, we'll start off with studios. Um, a studio in the city of Amsterdam can cost between 1100 to 1400 so a studio is just essentially one big room so you don't have the private bedroom situation so that's between 1100 and 1400 is what we're finding at the moment whereas if you went to Hilversum that can be from 650 to 900 euros so it is significantly cheaper and then as you move on up as well um, so if we'll go on to the three plus bedroom it's 2400 uh, 
2400 sorry euros and up for a property like that in Amsterdam whereas again in Hilversum it's 1300 so the price the price difference is significant and now these are some additional costs that you'll need to think about when you when you start renting so we'll start off with the deposit um, as a standard it is two months rent now this can differ depending on the landlord or the agent occasionally in uh, in unfurnished properties they'll only request a one month's deposit um, but then occasionally if it's a very high um, high level apartment uh, with lots of furnishings they can occasionally request a three months deposit but the general standard is two months so we'll stick with that as this as this example so um, you'd have to have the two months deposit as well as paying the first month's rent on top of that. So when you secure your apartments before you check in, you will need to essentially pay, uh, pay out three months worth of rent. Now the deposit um, is actually held directly by the landlord. Again, when I moved here, I thought that was quite, it felt quite di different, risky, I guess, because in the UK anyway, they have a deposit ho a protection scheme. Um, so that means the landlord can't run away with it, for example, whereas here, if you were to have a terrible landlord, they can sometimes, uh, they can sometimes not want to give the deposit back. Now that's very rare, it is rare that it's happened, it's not happened um, to me anyway, or to any of the clients that I'm aware of, but we've heard horror stories in the past, so that is just something to think about, and we do wish we could change this, we wish that there could be a deposit uh, protection holding scheme, but at this point, this is just the way it is in the Netherlands, so it's just something to keep in mind. And then next on top of that, um, we'll talk about utilities. So the utilities would be water, gas and electrics. And this is uh, this price varies depending on your usage, of course. Um, and this can be between 100 and 150 euros per month, depending on your usage. So, of course, if you like a tropical <laughs> feel and you put your heating really, really high up, you will be closer to the 150 euros per month, for example. And if you keep all your lights on, etc., common sense. Um, and then on top of that as well, the TV and internet, again, this can depend on the package that you decide to choose. Um, this ranges between 50 euros to 100 euros per month. So this is a, yeah, just extra cost for you to keep in mind when you're looking for a property to rent and looking at the prices. You can occasionally get properties where the utility costs are included, but a lot of the time they are exclusive, but that is something to look out for when you're doing your search. It will say it on the description. So just look out for that. Um, oh, and another tip that I'd like to share is when you are searching for your property, just have a look at the home's energy ratings. That will also be on the on the description of the property as well. So if it's an A, for example, which are quite they are quite hard to come by, that would mean it's got a great energy rating and your bills are going to be really low because it's yeah just low. Yeah, you don't need a lot of energy to run it. Whereas if it's like a G, then you want to really rethink if well, you really want to think if this is what you, what you'd like to go for. And then on top of that, we have the municipality taxes. Now these costs are done annually. It is a one-off cost, so it's not monthly. And for a one person household, it is 443 euros per year. And for a two person up, this is 643 people up euros per year, sorry. Now you can pay these off in one fell swoop, in one go, or if you do want, you can contact the, the municipality and you can ask to put in a payment plan. Now the mun municipality taxes are essentially uh, they pay for the rubbish disposal, the upkeep of the city, um, and yeah, pretty much yeah, just the upkeep of the city. So this is an annual cost. As I said, it's, it is just a one-off once a year, so you won't have to worry, worry about paying it uh, monthly. But something that I would like to also mention is that the taxes can be dependent on the value uh, on the value of the property, but they but this is just a number that we do go by. It's always going to be about four hundred forty-three euros for one person, or six hundred forty-three going up. The municipality taxes do also change depending on where you are living, depending on which um, city you are living in, but they are all around this, all around um, this price. We do have a um, municipality tax calculator uh, tool on our website, um, so if you are intrigued, you can go ahead and give that a go as well. Now I'll quickly talk about some resources that can help you search the market. So the main two search platforms are Cararius and Funda. So Funda is predominantly for purchasing homes, but they do have some rental homes um, as well. But Cararius is predominantly rental. So those are the two main platforms that you can go for. 
Um, when it comes to the corporate uh, corporations and funder uh, funds or investors. So these are obviously big corporations or people investing a lot in a big building. So what we found anyway is that it can be a lot more difficult and take a lot more time to secure one of these properties than if you were going with a more private landlord. And the reason for this is a lot of the time you will be put on a waiting list or there will be lots of people who will be applying and then it's kind of like a lottery. So rather than actually submitting a, um, a portfolio um, your, and an offer and then having it reread by the agents, it's essentially just a lottery. So it's a lot harder to manage. It's not impossible. We have helped clients using these, um, using these as well, but it's, it's a lot, there's, you can have a lot less control than if you were doing it uh, with a more private landlord. Something that you can also look for is uh, on social platforms. We tend to, we, I wouldn't say we advise against it, but we just want you all to be wary, of course, when it comes to Craigslist, Facebook, and CameraNet. CameraNet is specifically to, looking, uh, to look for a room to rent, um, just for your information. But of course, when it comes to social, social platforms like this, you can get people who might be subletting, you can get people who, yeah, when it's just not a legal situation and sometimes it can end up quite messily. So just be aware of that. And on this topic as well, I would like to say that there is a strict rule in uh, the Netherlands where you can only share with two people unless the landlord has a specific um, certificate um, that he's actually paid for to say that more than three people can register at the property. So when it comes to these social platforms, if you are looking for a room, you need to make sure that you can get registered because if you can't get registered registered at the property, then you will be li living there illegally and then you can be kicked out and get lots of fines. So wherever you decide to live, please make sure that you can register. Now I'll quickly move on to some housing agents that we work with and trust. So there is Relo, uh, Ahang Gas Group, JLG, Copes, uh, Copes, HB Housing, Nora State, Interhouse and Brosma. So these are all housing agents. They all have their own portfolio of properties um, that you can go for. A lot of their properties um, are also posted on Pararius and Funda, but if you want, you can go directly to their websites as well and have a browse at what they have to offer. And then I'm going to also quickly mention Tenant Hub. So Tenant Hub is a tool that we have created. Um, it is a completely free tool, um, but if you are a young professional and you are looking to move in with a sharer, uh, then you can actually find a potential sharer on Tenant Hub. You can get to know them and figure out if you guys want to live in the same kind of situation. And then from there, we can then move on and try and help you find a home together. So if you are just looking for a sharer, Tenant Hub might be a good, might be a good spot for you to look out. Now, apartment sharing. So as I've, as I've just meant, uh, mentioned, the local law does prohibit the sharing of an apartment by more than two unrelated adults. So of course, if you are a family and you've got children, that's absolutely fine, but it's more just two unrelated adults, the more than two unrelated adults cannot live together unless the landlord has a specific certificate. So uh, if you are renting a room in an existing rental, you really do need to make sure that you, could, that you have to register. And I can't stress, it, stress this enough. And then you need to make sure that you also have permission from the landlord. So if you were to go to uh, one of the social platforms, for example, and request a room, I would always suggest asking for contact with the landlord first. And it's also good to just have a good rapport with the landlord anyway, but just to make sure that you can live there legally and that is, it is as it should be. And another thing, as I'm going to quickly go back to Tenant Hub, if you want to avoid scams by finding your own rental with a flatmate, then you can, of course, use Tenant Hub to find another flatmate, and then we can find a new lease for you together. Let's quickly touch on the types of contracts that you might be seeing. So there are two main types of contracts. There is the definite contract, which is less, uh, which is more, um, sorry, <laughs> which is less than two years, and that is also known as a Model B contract. So with a Model B contract, you do have a maximum period of two years that you can live there. But the good thing about that is you don't have a minimum period of time. So you can leave within one calendar month's notice. So say if you moved in and then uh, maybe two weeks after you decided, oh, the road was too loud, for example, you can hand in your notice and then you can leave one calendar month, over that, uh, one calendar month after that. So you're not stuck there. Another thing to note about the Model B contract is that the landlord cannot kick you out um, and, until after the two years. But something that you should know as well is if, he, if the landlord or landlady has not gotten in touch with you three months before the end of your contract date, then you can technically stay on and that contract will then roll on into an indefinite contract, which I mean, you can stay there and then give one month's notice 
and they cannot evict you. So that's just good to know. It's good to know your rights. And now the other type of contract which we'll be talking about is the indefinite contract, and that is also known as a Model A. So the Model A contract is you have a minimum period of one year when you cannot leave, you are locked in for that one year. But then after that one year, the contract goes on to monthly rolling, and then you can um, give a new notice at one calendar month and then leave whenever you'd like. So with the indefinite contract, it is quite a safe option if you feel like you'll be staying if you feel quite secure um, in your job and in the home that you are living as well because you do have the like I said the minimum of one year's um, tenancy but then you can stay indefinitely you can stay there forever it's very yeah you it, you won't be evicted unless you do have a big breach of contract for example stop paying rents but it's very hard to be evicted I'm also going to briefly touch on a third type of contract. We, they're very rare, very rare to come by. We don't often work with them, but I think it might just be worth mentioning. It's called a Model C contract. And the Model C contract is essentially a set time period. And they normally come about when the landlord, for example, wants to, uh, needs to go away on like a, a, work, a work trip, for example, maybe six months or so. And then you just have a property for six months um, in that specific time. But like I said, they are quite rare and we don't often work with them, but just thought I'd mention them just in case. Now, some other things to consider when renting an apartment. First off, are you a smoker? It is absolutely illegal to smoke inside of a rental apartment. So if you are a smoker or if you enjoy having parties when we can have parties again, <laughs> whenever that may be, and uh, you have friends who like to have a, have a cigarette, then it's a really good idea to have uh, to look for an apartment with a balcony or access to an outside area, unless you don't mind going for a walk as well. But it's absolutely illegal to smoke inside an apartment building or yeah, in a, in a rental apartment. Another thing to consider, of course, is pets. Do you have pets? Um, a lot of uh, properties, especially furnished, uh, furnished properties, the landlords and agents uh, will not allow pets because they are afraid that the pets might, for example, yeah, scratch up the furniture, but they are a lot more readily available for um, unfurnished apartments and especially in shells. So shells and unfurnished, you should be able to bring your pets without a problem. Uh, but with furnished then that is more of a problem. A lot of the time um, the agent or the landlord will also put in a little pet clause into the contract just to state if there is any damage done by your pet then you can compensate us for that as well. Um, so a lot of uh, landlords as well will not, it's a lot more difficult to find a property that will accept more than two pets. Although it's not impossible, we did once have a client who had three cats and two dogs. And at first we we're like, oh no, how are we gonna find this? And then we eventually managed to find them a property. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but I just like to manage your expectations. Um, so two pets max is normally, is pretty easy to come by. Yeah. Uh, the third thing we'll mention is of course children. So in the Netherlands, uh, children start going to school at the age of four. So if you're moving over with uh, children who are just about to turn, who are just about to turn four, then we would recommend starting to look for a school, perhaps even starting to uh, before starting to look for an apartment. Now the reason I say this is because unlike in the UK anyway, um, here the school isn't dependent on the neighbourhood that you live in. It's dependent on the availability of space in the school. So for example, if you were to get, uh, if your kid were to be accepted um, in a school out in Amstel Vein, for example, and then you found a property in the center of Amsterdam, it would be quite difficult to commute. Again, not impossible. The cycle isn't, it, the cycle from Amstel Vein to the center would be about 25 minutes, I'd say. But still, if your kid wants to do lots of play dates, et cetera, it might be nice to be a bit closer. So sometimes it, it is worth looking for the school before looking for the apartment. And then of course, the fourth thing to look about for is the budget. Now, as a standard, we always advise to go by the three times rule in that your monthly gross income should be three times the amount of rent that you are willing to pay. And that is also the standard that lots of landlords and agents will look for too. Um, so the general idea is that you'd have a third of your income would be going on the rent, a third would be going on, uh, for example, your utilities and the food and the necessities to live. <laughs> and then the other third would be for your, your own amusement. So that's the general rule. So something also that I'd like to mention is, um, so obviously be realistic. Um, if you have a bit of a lower salary, then don't go for a very high budget property, but then it goes in the 
acts in the opposite direction as well, because obviously the landlords and agents do have access to seeing your monthly income, of course, when you put in an offer. And if they see that your income is far, far above what um, the three, far, far above the three times of what the apartment would be, then they can actually turn you down for that and say, no, we'd rather give it to someone with this general price range. So that's something to, to look out for as well. Just be realistic on both sides. So here are some top tips from us. If registering isn't possible, it is a sublet and please steer clear of that because as I said, if you cannot register at a property, then it will be illegal um, and then you can get evicted or you can have lots of fines. So please make sure you can register. So uh, when uh, written offers that are accepted are legally binding once they have been accepted. So if you were to put in an offer and then the landlord or agent accepts it and then you were to pull out, you can also be fined. And this can also this can be up to uh, the value of one month's worth of, worth of rent. So this is why we'd always suggest to not put two offers in on a property, uh, to, to, put, to not put two offers in at the same time, because if they are both accepted, then you can be stuck in a pickle. So only put one at a time. Landlords cannot simply evict you, as I've mentioned earlier. So know your rights, know your rights. Essentially, as I said, as long as you stick to the contract and you don't uh, break it, uh, for example, by not paying rent, for example, or just, yeah, just as long as you're living normally, there's no, way, there's no reason for you to be evicted. When it comes to the repairs and maintenance of your rental property, minor and major repairs up to the value of about 100 euros are the tenant's responsibility. Anything upwards of that, unless it's of course done by the tenant, um, would be the landlord's uh, responsibility. Rent can be increased yearly if mentioned in the contract, so obviously please look that look for that uh, look out for that in your contract as well. Uh, but most of the increases are regulated and linked to inflation, so they'll probably be about maybe one percent or so. Uh, but it's something to something to look out for in your contract. Something that we'd also really highly recommend is considering taking out liability insurance, home contents insurance and legal insurance. Now the great thing, I'm gonna quickly home in on the liability insurance here. It's about three euros per month per person. And then this basically covers you for any damage that you might do. So even if you were just on your bike and you were to lose control and accidentally hit a car and dent it, you could use a liability insurance and you would be covered. So we'd really recommend liability insurance. Another thing that we'd say, so Michael Lares, they're, they're the that's the Dutch word for estate agents, but Michael Lares, they shouldn't be charging you a fee unless you specifically ask them for your help. So do look out for this. Occasionally you might get some Michael Lares that are that actually request a fee before even viewing the property. They might say, in order to view the property, you need to already pay us 100 euros as a deposit, for example, in which case they should not be doing that. So always make sure that you are only paying for any service that you have specifically asked for. Here are some useful links for you as well. So here, the municipality, which is also called the Gemeente. Um, this is where you'd register at the address and this is where you pay taxes. So you do need to register, as I said, and this would be with the municipality. So the In Amsterdam office is the next one that I'll mention. And this is where you can register and get your BSN. So the BSN is essentially, well, in Dutch, is a Burgerservice nummer. And my accent, I'm working on my accent, <laughs> but it's essentially your uh, national insurance number. So when you register, uh, you will get a BSN and then that'll be your, your ins national insurance number. Uh, the IND, which is the immigration department and WOM, which is an institute for questions, complaints and anything else about renting. So say for example, if you were to, uh, if your landlord were to say that he would like to evict you, even though you've done nothing wrong, for example, you can always go to them and look for advice there and see, can he do this, for example? So yeah, it's a, it's a non-profit and they're just there to answer any questions that you might have. So Vone is a really good one to look out for. Now, the topic of 2020 and potentially 2021, coronavirus and renting during the coronavirus specifically. So at this point, of course, we can't do any more open houses. So viewings can be in person or via video. And they also need to be done with either one or two people maximum. Some agents are now asking for, um, if you are a couple, for you guys to come in individually one at a time. But some people are a lot more relaxed and will allow the couple in. But there are no more open houses. Of course, you also have to wear a mask. And occasionally, some agents will, requ will request that you uh, wear rubber gloves. But that is quite rare, but it is just something to look out for as well. 
um, negotiation is, is possible on higher end properties. So that is a fun thing. <laughs> that is fun at the moment. Um, but a lot of the time on the um, lower to average um, price properties, negotiation still isn't possible. Um, because the rental market is still very dynamic and it still does move very quickly. So, and as I said, <laughs> competition is still high on properties under 1400. It's, they are hard to come by and they go very quickly. They go like hotcakes. Watch out for short-term rental contracts and make sure that you can register. I've said it about three times and I'll say it again. <laughs> make sure you can register. And if it is short-term, uh, again, make sure you can register so that it's not a sublet, for example. And it's also very important and a nice idea to maintain a good contact with your landlord. And if you are experiencing financial trouble, then talk to your landlord. Communication is key. I'll quickly talk about our service packages that we, uh, that we provide. So we have three types of packages. We have either the basic package, which we'd recommend for people who are perhaps already renting in Amsterdam and just need someone to help with the admin side of things. At this point, we would um, the basic package includes an intake with a dedicated expat rental manager, and this dedicated expat rental this dedicated expat rental manager will also be available to answer any questions or concerns that you have throughout the whole process. So even though you're you'd be doing it alone, essentially, you could still feel completely supported. So you can always reach out to them if you'd like. We also provide you with our guides and checklists. So again, even though you might be doing the viewings or uh, doing your searches alone, you would still feel supported uh, with our guides and checklists. Once you find a property that you'd like, we would then submit the offer for you. Of course, with your approval, we do make sure that you, uh, that the tenant uh, or the prospective tenant reads, uh, reads and approves the offer before we send it through, of course. And then once that is approved by the agent and the landlord, we would then uh, review your contract to make sure that it is um, to make sure it's all legal and you don't have any nasty surprises at the end of your tenancy. And then we'd also set up your utilities for you. So that would be gas, water, electrics and Internet and TV. The smart uh, and sorry, <laughs> and that package is 599 euros uh, total, including VAT. We do require a 99 euro deposit, which is then deducted from the final uh, from the final um, invoice. So it is 599 inclusive. Um, and then the smart package is everything that you've seen on the basic, but then we then do the search for you. Uh, we would provide a search sheet with a list of properties that would suit your criteria. And then from that, you can choose which ones you would like us to schedule the viewings for. So we would then schedule the viewings for you as well. Um, and then you would go along and do the viewings yourself, again, supported by the checklist that we, that we earlier mentioned. And this one is 999 euros all inclusive. Again, we do require a deposit, which is then deducted from the final invoice, and that deposit is 199 euros. And then the complete package um, is uh, essentially the smart, but then you've got in-person help as well. So we attend the viewings for you, we attend the, uh, we attend the viewings with you, and we also attend the check-in for you. Um, so something also that we do like to do with the complete package is something that we've noticed, especially during coronavirus uh, and the 10 day quarantine, is people are wanting to do their searches completely virtually. So with this package, you would be able to do it completely virtually. So we can uh, do the search list and then you can choose which properties you would like us to do video viewings for. We can either do them live for you or we can send you the videos for you to, to review on your own. And then we would then, if you would like, we can also attend the check-in for you on your behalf. And then whenever you're ready to arrive in the Netherlands, we can sort out a time to swap over the keys. And, um, and then you would just go directly into your house and you can quarantine there. So we're finding people like to do that now. But also we do this in person as well. So if you are in the, if you are in the city um, and want to go on viewings but feel more supported, then we've got the complete package for you. And that is 19.99 total, again, with a deposit. Uh, which is then deducted from the final invoice. And if you are unsure if you'd like to rent or buy, we do also host a buying webinar and the next one is on the 4th of February. Um, so feel free to register via Eventbrite, it's on the same page. Um, and yeah, maybe you might find that one a bit interesting as well. And I was Mary, I'm the operations officer. Um, if you have any questions or if you would like us to send through this video, please send any emails to welcome at expathousingnetwork.nl and our phone number is there as well. Now I'll quickly answer some questions. I think I've seen quite a few, let me stop share. All right, here we go. Ah, yes, great. So first I'll answer Jasmina's question. 
And Jasmina asks, if your employer can register you in a business address while you're looking for an apartment, does it cost you something? Given that you are an expat and still located in your home country until you find an apartment? And that's a very good question. No, so it won't cost you anything. So um, at this point, I'll use an example. In fact, we work um, very closely with TomTom. Tom. Uh, we help to relocate their new hires and they have temporary accommodation. Um, and at that temporary accommodation, um, they have it for a month, but that with that, they can register under their company's address. So um, by registering under their, their company's address, they get their BSN directly, which allows them to open up a bank account, and then everything can run smoothly when it comes to uh, finalizing and renting your apartment. Um, it doesn't cost extra, but as long as your uh, company does allow you to register under their address, that's absolutely fine. Um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Um, and now Ellery, how long between viewing and moving in? So our average is about, we'd say two weeks for the whole process, but that is our average. But then also it depends entirely on the clients and on the tenants. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So for example, um, you might see one apartment and fall in love with it and then the offer can be accepted and then that can be done within maybe two days. Whereas you can of course have the flip side where you might want to continue to view apartments and then that can take however long you want it to be. Um, but we do, we'd average about a week and a half to two weeks, I think is a safe bet. Una says, what is the cost of agency fees? Um, so the costs that I've said about us um, have all been listed, so it depends on the package. But um, if you were to use us, then you shouldn't have other agency fees. Um, but agency fees do tend to be about one month's worth of rent. And Una again, what do you value as high-end properties able for negotiation? So we'd say probably 2,500 and up. 2,500 and up, we'd say, is when negotiations can be more possible. But again, it's not 100% given, but we're just seeing that it is more possible than in the past. Your landlord said you had to buy home insurance, so is this illegal? Um, no, so it's not illegal. We would, well, actually, home insurance should be on the landlord, but, um, but uh, what's it called? Property insurance, so sorry. Uh, so yeah, so property insurance, so your furniture insurance, that should be on you. Um, but I'd be interested to know, so does your, land, does your landlord not have home insurance? If he's the owner, he should insure the home, but you should um, insure the contents if it's yours. And Ellery says, what is the rental for two bedroom in Harlem or Almira areas? Again, that can kind of differ. Um, I'd say probably Harlem, let's go for around, for a two bedroom between 16 to 18, maybe. So between 1600 and 1800, depending on the quality that you're looking for as well. And Almira, I'd say between maybe 1400 and 1600. Ah, yes, uh, then uh, you do, you would need to ensure your contents. Um, it, it's highly, highly advised. Um, it's not 100% necessary, but it, it is highly advised. So we've got our contents insurance because yeah, most people do. <laughs> so, and it's just safer and it's not, it's not cheap. It's again about maybe six euros. So I just recommend doing that. And if it was in the contract, then yes, you should do, then you should definitely do your contents insurance. Jasmina, what are the approximate costs, rough number, to install flooring and paint walls, including hiring the workers to do so if your rental apartment is, ooh, that is, uh, that is around 40 meters squared? That's a good question, it, because it really does depend on, um, on the quality of floor that you're going for. But say, as an example, a couple of colleagues of mine, they put in their floor. Um, I think their property is about 60 meters square or so, and their floor was about 800, 900 euros in total. But again, it can vary depending on the, um, depending on the quality or the type of floor that you choose. MV asked, what is the most common contract, definite or indefinite? So when it comes to definite and indefinite, I'd say that 
they're not there's not one that's significantly more common than the other but i'd say if there was one it would probably be the definite is a bit more common uh, just because it gives the landlord uh, a bit more security and that you'd want to stay there longer uh, but then of course you do have landlords that specifically want it to be just for two years so yeah th there's not one that's significantly more common than the other Is it possible to rent a two bed on your own and then find a person and then change the contract to renting per room so I'm not stuck if the person leaves? Is that possible? No. So if you are a sharer, well, so let me just make sure that I'm understanding this. So if you were to rent a property with two beds, you personally could not rent out the room uh, to a sharer. Um, that would need to be on the landlord because if not, that would be subletting. Um, so you need to make sure that they are on the contract. You can, of course, talk to your landlord about this um, if he would like to go ahead with this. But most of the time, if he is looking for shares, that would be on the contract to begin with. Um, so another thing that I'd like to mention on this topic is if you are going with, uh, if you are moving in with a sharer, um, and then one of you wants to break the contract, then they, then the person who is leaving and who broke the contract, they still need to hold up their end of the bargain. So they still need to pay rent unless they find um, a new tenant to replace them and have communicated this with the landlord. I rented before COVID two years ago. Has something changed? My friend says that it's easier now. Is that true? Also, the price in Funda is the renting price or is there a bidding on top of it? Yeah, good question. So something that we've noticed is that the rental market has, I wouldn't say slowed down, but has become a little bit cheaper. Um, but because of that, it is still just as dynamic as ever. So we're finding it, the rental market is still moving incredibly quickly. Um, People are buying a lot more than they are renting now, though. I suspect it's because people want to feel like home and very stable in, in such times. But um, yeah, uh, there's been a bit of a dip, but I'd still say it's, it is still quite dynamic. And then also is the price in Funda the renting price or is there bidding on top of it? That is the rental price. Um, occasionally you can negotiate down or if someone were to really, really, really want a property, they can negotiate up, but it is quite rare. So that is the rental price. You shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to negotiate any higher or bid any higher for rental. For buying, yes, but for rental, no. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, then I just I got a follow up to the question about the contract, I believe, uh, with the two uh, with the two people. If you ask the landlord to change it, then that should be fine. As again, as long as you communicate with the landlord, then you should be fine. And as long as the landlord is happy with it, then all is well. And then he said, uh, but Wung said to change contract to rent per room and not per property. That's why. Wound said to change contract to rent per room. When you say per property or per room, so I mean, you like I said, you can ask your, your landlord if he would like to change the contract, but that is entirely up to him. Um, and you could do that per room, but I'm not entirely sure what you mean by not per property, as I'm seeing it as one property with two rooms, no? So I'll, I'll keep this question on hold and then I'll move on to the others. Let's check our chat now. Da, 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 da. Right. And now I've got a number in. Here we go. Ah, okay. So, Una, you say, I hear the deposit is commonly stolen by landlords. Interesting. It's not, I, like I said, we haven't really experienced it. We have sometimes experienced landlords being slow on returning the deposit um, because they do technically need to uh, send it back within two weeks. Um, but then they've wanted to wait until payday, for example. But to actually steal the uh, to actually steal the deposits, we've not we've not really experienced that. But maybe sending back would be slower. And then Una also says, "I'm looking for a flatmate to search with." Oh, anyone else? If anyone else is on here <laughs> that, that would like to share with Una, get in touch. <laughs> um, oh, and thank you all. So, thank you all about the the screen sharing. That was a bit of a technical difficulty. Um, do, do, do. Then Ellery, how long between viewing and moving? That one I've already um, explained, but like I said, it's around two weeks, um, but it does differ per tenant. And then you said, can you rent remotely? 
that is possible. Um, if you were to do the complete package, then we can sort that out for you. And like I said, we could do the video viewings on your behalf, and then you can choose the property based on that. Um, and then, like I said, we could do the check-in on your behalf as well. Um, make sure that all of the inventory is taken as it should be, and then you can move in directly. So that is possible. Agency fees I've also discussed. Um, they are normally around one month's rent, but if you are paying for, but only if you're paying for a service, of course, you need to make sure that you're only paying for something that you specifically asked for. Um, and then do do do. Yeah, and I've just, uh, sorry, I've just noticed that I'm rereading questions from the Q and A to the chat. So if you do want me to reiterate any questions, please just let me know. Um, and then I've got a couple more in the Q and A here. Um, if you have to cancel a definite contract before it ends, is there usually a penalty fee for this and how much is it in that case? Yes, so the essentially the point of a contract is for it to not be broken. So if you were to rent, uh, get an indefinite contract and you were to try and break it within that, within that first year, it would be very difficult to get out of and you might need to pay the rest of the tenancy. So for example, if you were staying there for seven months and wanted to get out, then you need to pay potentially, to, again, depending on the landlord and the agent, but as a general, you'd need to pay for the rest of that month because you have signed that contract and you have agreed to that. And Islam Mustafa would like to know, you're on a type C contract. Can this be changed to type B after the first term? That is entirely dependent on the landlord as well. So I'll, I'll quickly speak from personal experience. Um, when I first moved here, I was on a type C contract um, because my partner and I, my partner and I uh, just wanted to find somewhere in relatively short term so that then we could explore the city um, and find out where we actually wanted to settle. And so our initial uh, part, um, type C contract was just for six months. And then the landlords decided they wanted to continue staying in France and they just kept um, renewing our type C contract. So by, by six months, but then it is possible for your landlord to change their mind and then eventually say, hey, do you want me to upgrade this to a Model B uh, or a Model A? whichever you prefer. Um, but it's also good if, if you do want to know, you can just ask your landlord directly. Um, it does depend entirely on them and their plans, because a lot of the time, as I've said previously, with type C contracts, um, they are only wanting to rent for that specific amount of time because they're away for that specific amount of time. Any other questions before I leave you all? Anything else I can help with? All right, if not, um, or if not, then I will bid you all a good evening. But if you do find that you, ooh, Ellery, how do you get this video? We can send it to you, not to worry. Um, so if you'd also like to maybe just, uh, just to double check, you can send us through an email to welcome at ehn.works. Um, but we do also have your name on file. I can put, I'll just put a note um, in my calendar actually, just to make sure that we can send the video to you. Um, but if anyone else wants to specifically please just do send it to uh, send through a request and we'll make sure to send it to you. Great. So yeah, as I said, um, if you do want to look back at this video, just reach out to us. We'll send it straight to you. And if you have any other questions that pop up later on, uh, later on this evening that you forgot to answer, uh, that you forgot to ask, just send it through to us and we're more than happy to help. Um, yeah, so we do have a phone number, of course, just feel free to check our website for our contact details. Um, and yeah, I hope you found this helpful. And I hope you're all excited to move to the Netherlands. It is great fun, especially when it's not in lockdown. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you'll all have a good time when you get here. All right, thank you all for joining. And ooh, let me just make sure there's yeah. Or, oh, fine up on Juliana. <laughs> All right, thank you all very much uh, for joining and have a lovely rest of your evenings. All right, bye all.